stirs you for holy things and for decisions made. Uh, he is so worthy of us saying things to him and singing to him. And um, I, I'm, I don't know about you. I know how old I am. But I've been coming to church in some fashion, some form, in some place for 45 years. And, and for some of you, you would probably say, well, that's just a little bit of time. Some of you may be thinking you're an old man. All right. We can go on either side of that. But, but this morning I woke up with a sense of excitement to worship God. And I want to ask you to join me in that. Can we sing a little bit more today? Maybe from a little place a little deeper down inside of our heart. Maybe a little louder. Maybe with a little more passion. Can, 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 we, can we be more, a little more studious as we open God's Word together and give with a little more heart? You get the idea. Today is a day for worship. And Jesus is worth it. Um, a few announcements to put us on top of our mind. Don't forget, uh, for Operation Christmas Child this month, uh, our, our project is to get, get, excuse me, gather school supplies. So if you would like to bring in school supplies, you know, pencils, paper, you know, that sort of thing, erasers, um, we will uh, be collecting those as we get ready for this fall. I want to encourage you to be generous and to give well in that area. Um, our our heirs, um, who last weekend at this time, where is Freddie? He's 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 keeping us safe and secure today. Freddie's on security detail, but this this time last week, Freddie was organizing a, or finishing up the organization of a of a RA camp out where there were several boys and their fathers were gathered. Um, those same RA boys are doing a food drive right now, so pay attention to your bulletin for that announcement. Um, and then there's also the Backpack Buddy ministry that's going on right now. That announcement's in your bulletin. Um, on June the 26th, uh, we will have um, uh, our a baptism service and the Lord's Supper together. Now, I'm telling you this early because we're aiming for something. We have some that are ready for baptism, but are you in that pack too? Are you somebody that says, I've never made a public profession and, or, or would like to join Lillington Baptist Church and be baptized? You know, just June the 26th is what we're aiming for with that. And it's a worthy time of celebration and worship of our Heavenly Father. This weekend, this weekend, our, our girls and our children met upstairs on the third floor on Friday night to watch the movie Sing 2. Have you ever seen Sing 1? If you haven't, it's just it's a wonderful musical for children. And so the second one came out. They met. There were there were nearly twenty children upstairs with them, and and adults and parents that were gathered there with them. I like so that's that's on top of that. We have some successful ministries going on. In our children, our children will be meeting next on the twenty second for a fun in the Sunday, which is a Tuesday. You come if you're a child at heart. I'm, I'm, I don't want to get too far. I might get in trouble with Miss Amanda. But let's support them. Let's continue to promote them. And uh, exciting things going on at Lullington Baptist Church. God bless you. And let's now worship the Lord with a sense of energy and passion today. Good morning. We're so glad that you've joined us for this time of worship. There are so many things in our world and in our life circumstances that can overwhelm us that can cause our soul to be downcast. And there are two great words in the Bible. One is but. And in Psalm 3, 3, it says, But you, Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. And the other one is yet. And in Lamentations, we have these wonderful words yet this i call to mind and therefore i have hope because of the lord's great love we are not consumed for his compassions never fail they are new every morning great is your faithfulness Amen. We serve such a great God. In everything he is, he's great. And in his faithfulness as well. So let's stand as we sing our prayer. You know, I think when we get to heaven, it, you will not question when to applaud. Okay? I, I just don't, I don't, when, when we get there, you know, we're going to be filled and surrounded with the splendor of God. I think the angels are going to be leading away. I don't think we're going to be like, is my neighbor clapping with me? 
You know, um, I'm glad that you're here today. I consider it just such a treat to worship with you. And if you're visiting here, uh, if you're visiting with us online, um, uh, our goal is to connect with Jesus Christ, heart, mind, and soul. Um, and so uh, take a few moments, and if you, if you have a prayer need, or if you need to use that connection card that's in the pew rack, or, or the chat window, or send us an email, um, we want to be able to minister with you and to you uh, in the days ahead. Um, and so uh, we're, we're in the book of Jonah, so I want to encourage you to open uh, up your copy of God's Word, or Turn on your gadget and go down to, to Jonah. Um, I'm going to start reading actually in chapter 1, verse 17. And we'll be focusing on chapter 2 today. Um, chapter 1, verse 17. Because um, in the, the sermon series that I've called, entitled this is Big Fish. Now last week our children were with us and um, you know I asked what came and, and swallowed Jonah. You remember they said a, a whale or, or a big fish. And, and to be fair, while that is the part of the story that we probably remember really well, I, I'm more thinking about what's the big idea that we need to cling a hold of right now. When I say a big fish, I'm not just talking about going fishing. I'm talking about honestly, you know, what, what's that big fish that if you got a hold of today might take your life from good to great, might change the way that you conduct yourself, might change things. And last week's big fish idea was God has a plan. And that plan of God was for Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach against it, to, to bring God's judgment against it, because God has a plan for Nineveh. And if God has a plan for Jonah, Nineveh, he has a plan for Jonah. And, and do you understand how it kind of cascades there? God has a plan, and so that means he also has a plan for your life. And you, God's plan for your life will most likely involve sharing grace in the mission of Jesus Christ. It was Jonah's job in Nineveh. So I just transpose that for us. Brothers and sisters. God has a call for your life. Now Jonah's danger is that he ran away. 2,500 miles away. He would rather go 2,500 miles. Than a few hundred miles away. To his neighbor in Nineveh. And let me say it. I just need to say this. Get it off my chest. Man that sounds just like us. It does. I like think about missions in China in some faraway land and we'll think about it and we'll give towards it and, and sacrificially praise the Lord that we do that. But we struggle telling our neighbor that Jesus Christ died on the cross to save them from our sin. God has a plan. He has a plan for your life. And it will most likely involve grace and the mission of Jesus Christ. But like Jonah, sometimes we run. Whatever you do. So there are some things like I'm not going to preach on. Some things I'm not going to preach on. And so I'm going to kind of encapsulate those just for a few minutes here in the beginning. Um, so, so number one, God's mission is God sized. If, if you could do it all by yourself, you wouldn't need God. You wouldn't need Jesus Christ. So you might not need to be saved. Do you hear the danger? But the mission is God sized. It's massive. So we need Jesus Christ. We need His salvation. We need God's help along the way on the mission or the calling or whatever the plan is for your life. And so because it's God's size, it will require a step of faith for us. If it were easy, again, anybody would do it. Nineveh was a God's size problem for Jonah because it was the enemy of Israel. Mortal enemy like hate, hate, hate Nineveh. And he had to get over that to go. But whatever you do, whatever you do from this point forward, don't run away from God. Because he might send a great big fish to swallow you up. You laugh. But my prayer for you today, my prayer for me, is that if, I'm in, if I've been running away from God, if I'm not connected to his plan and to his mission, if I'm not, it is a mercy for us that he would send a great big fish. And I pray that he's gentle. That I pray that he's absolutely effective because some of us aren't connected to the mission and aren't connected to the plan. And we don't, but we don't want the great big fish, do we? But maybe that great big fish 
Maybe God's discipline. And this is the big idea for today. The big fish for today. Maybe God's discipline is useful. Especially if it brings us back to his mission. And to his redemptive plan. Um, So there are two famous bodies of water in scripture. One is the Sea of Galilee. The other is the. I didn't all jump on that one. The Dead Sea. Come on, guys. There are two, two famous bodies of water in, in Scripture in this Holy Land area um, that Jesus is walking around. The Sea of Galilee, beautiful. Um, it's like 11 miles long and like, like five or six miles wide and just flourishing and, and beautiful. Um, but uh, about 50 miles south of that is the Dead Sea, you know, or, or some distance south of that is the Dead Sea. And it, it's, 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 excuse me, it's almost four times as large as the Sea of Galilee. There are like 2,500 you know, little tributaries that kind of streams and stuff that kind of run into uh, this area. Um, but what makes the Sea of Galilee live and flourishing and the Dead Sea dead? The Dead Sea contains at any given time 26 to 30 percent, uh, 26 to 30 percent salt consistency. It has so much salt in it that it has a covering on top that kind of looks like a crystallized layer. What fish sometimes do, you know, coming down the way, uh, you know, get lost and swim down into the Sea of Galilee, of which they will, they will die because the salt coats their lungs and they can't breathe. Comes in through their gills, coats their lungs, they can't breathe. So what's the difference? Why? Why? Because they're both in the, you know, they're just a little ways away from each other. They're not a long ways away from each other. The difference between these two bodies of water is, is that the Sea of Galilee not only has inlets, it has outlets. The Dead Sea has no outlets. And so whatever flows to the Dead Sea stays there, it dies there, and therefore salt dead. Sometimes our life is like that too. Or let's just say all the time it is. We get a word from God. Don't run from God. We get a word from God. Let's say the word is don't run from God. We, we, we get stirred up for missions. You know, we get stirred up. But we need an outlet for that. It's one thing to know it. It's, it's another to do it as well. If we don't ever live out and take steps of faith, uh, act upon that which we believe God calling us to, if we don't ever act upon the great mission God has, we do just like what the Dead Sea does, and our spiritual life stagnates because it's a place of ending and not a place of beginning. Are you going to be a place of beginning today? Now, the truth is that some of us are not attached to the great plan of God that will involve grace, that will involve the mission of Jesus Christ. So our call today, our call today, is that God will get a hold of our hearts. And even if He has to send a great big fish, we would be like Jonah and do what we vowed to do. Would you please stand with me as we read this section of Jonah? Jonah, I'm going to start in chapter 1, verse 17, and I'll carry through chapter 2. Now the word, excuse me, now the Lord God provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. And from, and from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. And he said, In my distress, I called to you, Lord, and, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep and into the very heart of the sea, and all the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surround me. The sea water was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up. From the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayers rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish. And it vomited Jonah onto dry. Heavenly Father, we just ask that through this story of Jonah, 
that in your discipline upon us, that you would bring us to a place of repentance. Father, for all of us who are not a part of your great mission, your great plan, today, Father, we would hear the call and follow in obedience. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please have a seat. Please have a seat with me. Um, so, so let's just kind of tackle this uh, in three ways. I actually preached on chapter 1, verse 17 but uh, last week, but I just thought it was a great idea to, to jump start chapter 2 into this week. So this great big fish comes and swallows Jonah. And we would all ask, how does a great big fish swallow Jonah? You think that that is exciting? Man, there are many fish in the ocean way larger than I am. I don't think that's quite that quite amazing. What I think is quite amazing is that God did it. What I think is the miraculous part is that God made a fish swallow Jonah. Why would God make a fish to swallow Jonah? I think that's the better question. Not how did the, the fish survive, but why would God make a fish to swallow Jonah? And we all know the answer to that, don't we? Jonah was sinning and he fled from God. Now, have you ever felt like you were in the fill, in the valley, excuse me, in the, the belly of a great big fish? Now, you may ask, Daniel, what does that feel like? Well, there was once a guy that is legend to have gotten stuck in the belly of a fish. And this was his, excuse me, his description. And, and I don't think it was for like three or four days, if memory serves me, it was just a couple of days that he was in the belly of a fish. And, and when he came out, his skin was a little more bleached. His hair was a little more frazzled. Of course, he hadn't been doing proper hygiene because he was in the belly of a fish. But what he said, that, excuse me, separated it the most was that all he could hear and feel was the fish. And you, you would think, well, that makes perfect sense. He's in the belly of a fish. Most of us think he's in the stomach and, you know, trying to figure out how to survive stomach acids. His testimony was is that he was kind of in the, the gullet and all he could feel and hear was the fish. Maybe God has a purpose for fish, for this fish. Maybe God has a purpose for those times when we feel like we're in the belly of a great big fish. But all we can do is hear and feel God. Because the danger is, if we keep on going on our own way, Keep on like, like the Dead Sea. Our lives will stagnate. We will feel like death. We'll feel like we're separated from God. That's the danger. And so I, I totally think that today. That the fish is a grace of God. The fish is a grace of God. Jonah's in the, the belly of the fish. And this, this is a very beautiful poetic prayer that he prays. He actually quotes the book of Psalms eight times. Yeah, I went like that and forgot to put the five up. Did you see that? Um, he actually quotes the, the Psalms eight times uh, in one way or another through this passage. And this is his lament of suffering. This is his lament of I'm in the belly of a fish. Now, look, if you're in the belly of a fish, then I would read Jonah's prayer. If you know this experience or if you feel like it right now, how relevant is this section for us? For our world today, where everything feels like a little bit of separation and death from God, doesn't it? Doesn't this prayer now just seem to feel so much more relevant? Jonah's trapped again, and his first part of the prayer um, is, it's all really exciting. So for me, I've, you know, the second chapter of Jonah is the most poetic of all the books. Uh, he says, in my distress, uh, the, the Hebrew idea here for distress is, is a straight and narrow pathway, like a straight, an S-T-R-A-I-T, a straight. You know, the straight and, and narrow, and you've got a direction. And, and sometimes we get going on our own direction and our own distress because we disobeyed God, because we're fleeing from Him. And so we're going on that pathway. And I would pray that somewhere in our distress or in the straight of that, that line of thinking, I would pray that we would get a hold of what's actually happening. I said it last week, and I need to re-say it just for a moment. 
um, our young people were sitting right here. And you remember I looked down at them and said, if you, if you don't hear anything, hear this. Your direction determines your destination. Where you're headed matters. And some of us are not headed in the right direction. And I pray that today, that in that, in that pathway, in that narrow strait, we would turn to God. I called to the Lord and He answers me. And some of us get so fearful about the path that we're on right now <clears throat> because we, we believe the lie that we're too far gone or that God, you know, God can't forgive us or whatever the issue is. I'm a Jonah. We're all a Jonah. And, and we feel like we're too far gone for God to, to deal with us and to forgive us and to redeem us. But that's not true. God hears Jonah's prayer down in the belly of a fish. From the deep, uh, in the deep, uh, in Scripture, this is language for being separated from God or feeling spiritual anguish. Do you remember what Romans tells us? What, is, what are the consequences of sin? What? Consequences of sin and fleeing from God is death. So did Jonah get the consequence from fleeing from God? Yes. Jonah is in the belly of a fish, separated from God, and for all intents and purposes, he feels like he's about to die. And again, still in this first section, you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep and into the very heart of the sea, into the current swirled around me, and all the waves and breakers swept over me. Um, when I read verse 3 here, or, or the second part of verse um, 3, I really get... Um, that Jonah is starting to feel the weight of the world that he's living in. It's just the, the, the poetry. Uh, he feels like the, the, the pressure of the deeps. The, the, in the very heart of the sea. The separation from God. And the storm. of the, And the swirling water. And the waves breaking down. Have you ever felt like that? I have. Uh, excuse me. I've been banished from your sight. Separation. And I will look again towards your holy temple. And so let me let me just start this off with a few phrases. Um, the passage here. If God has a plan for your life, wouldn't it be merciful for God when you're not on his plan to come and get you? Are we on the same pathway? If God has a plan for your life, wouldn't it be just for God to come into your life and make sure that you're on that plan? We would say, yeah, I mean, God's God. And if I'm not on the right path, God should come into my life and help get me on the right path. Okay? And so Jonah is on the wrong path. God sends the fish and he starts to finally see the consequences of disobedience. Consequences of disobedience. You would say, well, he's in the belly of a fish. Shouldn't he be feeling the consequences then? Well, I'm talking about the poetry of his prayer. He feels separated from God. He feels like his life is is under the pressure of and with no joy and no peace from God. Doesn't that sound like a life separated from God? Oh, that we would see the areas in our lives that we're separated from him, that we might in turn do what Jonah does. Uh, excuse me, verse um, verse four. Yet I will look again towards your holy temple. I want to turn my gaze. If I'm, if I'm not living um, an obedient life or fleeing from God or not a part of His mission, I want, I want to turn my gaze back. I said I have been banished from your side again, yet I will look against your holy temple. Verse 5, the engulfing waters threaten me. The deep surround me. He doesn't, the seaweed literally, literally wrapped around him. He feels like he's walking around separated, dealing with the consequences of his disobedience. So I, I want to I elevate that sin has consequences. If we're running from God, there are consequences. We want to know why bad things happen in our world today. In my humble opinion, because we're all fallen, we're all broken, and there's consequences for that. I wish there was a better answer. I wish in some way we could just feel better and look better and act better. But, you know, the truth is sin has consequences. 
And Jonah's suffering unto those. Oddly enough, here's the parallel. The judgment that he was supposed to go and hand to Nineveh, he's getting. If he would have just gone to Nineveh, this could have been their judgment. They could have been in the belly of the metaphorical fish. But the fish, even for the people of Nineveh, has a purpose. And the purpose is grace. The purpose is redemption. Jonah was always supposed to go to Nineveh because he was supposed to be a part of the mission and grace of God to share with Nineveh so that Nineveh doesn't get the very same judgment that he's getting because nobody's life needs to be spent in the belly of a fish. And if a fish can save us from that type of life, then even the discipline of God has a purpose. Nobody really likes the discipline of God, do they? Like, how long do you think it took for Jonah to really repent? You know what I mean? Like, like, was it like the first hour he's sitting there in the belly of the fish looking up and he starts praying this prayer? How long do you think it took? Do you think maybe this is like, like day three and a half? Excuse me, day two and a half? You know, he's thoroughly learned his lesson now. And now he, you know, some of us are, for lack of better words, thick-headed. And it takes us a little while to learn our lesson. You know, maybe, maybe he's been there for two. I'll tell you exactly when I think he started repenting. About the time those sailors, those sailors started swinging him back and forth, getting ready to throw him in the ocean. And one, two, and I bet you about at three, he started going, oh, I'm so sorry, Lord, this was bad. This is so bad. And if the discipline of God takes us to a place of repentance, and we come before our Lord and we say, I'm sorry that I've sinned. I'm sorry I disobeyed. Sorry I'm not a part of your plan. I'm sorry I'm not sharing your grace. Wouldn't we actually want that to happen as soon as possible? We don't, we don't want to linger in disobedience, do we? We don't want to linger in consequences. We, we want the grace of a fish to minister to us as quick as possible. Verse 6 to the roots of the mountains I sank. And the earth beneath barred me in. It, it is, a, a, again, it's poetry. It's a poetic prayer of him being trapped behind the gates of hell. Barred in underneath the earth. That's the way he feels in his heart. Have you ever felt like that? In the belly of a fish. Here's the great news. This not a point in my sermon. This is a freebie. Are you ready? Man, God gives second chances. And Jonah's story is not the end. God's purpose for the fish is redemption. It's redemption for Jonah. So if it's the redemption for Jonah and you feel like you're in the belly of a fish and I just said that God gives second chances, that means that today, right now, today, we can have a second chance. That means today, our culture can have a second chance. The world, America, our church, we get to have a second chance because God's not done with Jonah yet. And if God's not done with Jonah, He's not done with me. If He's not done with me, He's not done with you. If He's not done with you, He's not done with the Nineveh that is our world that needs to be redeemed. Verse 7, when he was, let's get to the end of verse 6. But you, Lord uh, God, heard me and brought me up from the pit. So he's not only in the fish. I mean, just c c carry on with the metaphor. He's not only in the fish, but the, the fish swam down to the deepest, darkest part of the ocean. And just held him there. But there is no place too far away from God, from Him to hear our prayers, from Him to respond. That's the nature of grace. That's why the fish is a grace. That's why we, that's why we want today in some way to pray to our Heavenly Father and ask Him for that grace. I'm trying to def define grace. I've been trying to define grace all of my life. You know, some people say unmerited favor. I, right, right now, I'm on undeserved gift. Like I deserve something else. I deserve to be in the fish. I deserve to be at the bottom of the ocean in the deepest pit. I don't deserve to be saved and redeemed 
been rescued. And that's what God does. But sometimes, sometimes we've been fleeing from God. Sometimes he has to use a fish to get us to the point where we might in turn repent. To turn away. To look at that life. Because now, now I get the poetic picture. He's saying, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be tangled up in seaweed. I don't want to be down in the pit. I hate this place. God, listen to my prayer. And if whatever God is doing, whatever measure of dis discipline gets us to the place where we say, I hate it here and want to go join God. Praise the Lord for that. The end of verse 7, my prayers rose to your holy temple because God is listening, waiting for that prayer, looking for us. Verse 8, those who cleanse. So we got a, a little bit of a um, a little bit of a turnaround in the language here. Um, when my life excuse me, those who cling to worthless idols, but it's not so disconnected if you think about it like this. OK. He was supposed to go to Nineveh where they worshipped many gods. Or even in Tarshish, which is the far off place where they worshipped many gods. And now he ran away from God, ultimately saying, in some way, I'm going to determine the own dir my direction for my life. Therefore, you're not my God. And all of that is worthless living. People in Nineveh have been living worthlessly. And now Jonah, I believe, has a better perception about that because he found out he's been living worthlessly. He pursued maybe the worst idol of all. You know what the worst idol of all is? Self. I worship myself. My way. If it's not my way, I'm going to be mad at you. I'm going to argue with you. I'm going to be vindictive and I'm going to get against you. I'm going to be arrogant. I'm going to be prideful. And I'm going to do it on purpose. Because it's my way. Worshipping self is the same emptiness as worshipping many other things. So Jonah says, um, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love. We can agree. That's pretty straightforward. When we're into idolatry, we're into worshipping self, we're turning away from God. But in verse 9, my favorite part, but I will shout in the belly of a fish. Have you ever been in the belly of a fish and shout? You're like, no, Daniel, you keep saying that. It's a metaphor. Have you been in the deepest, darkest place, swallowed up by the consequences of our own sin? And maybe that should be the place that we start praising the Lord. I know it sounds funny. But maybe Jonah starts singing a hymn in the middle of the ocean, in the belly of a fish. What hymn would he be singing? Amazing Grace. I know which one you're saying. I have decided to follow Jesus. That's totally it. He's been in every other place, in the wrong place, and now in the belly of a fish. The other fish in the ocean start hearing this gargled Hebrew, I have decided to follow Jesus. And if that fish got him to that place where he could be obedient, because there's some people in Nineveh that need Jonah to go and tell them. Because if they don't. Because if he doesn't. Redemption is not going to be had. in And he said what I have vowed. What, what did Jonah vow? Jonah was a prophet. He vowed to be on mission for God. That wherever God said to go. He would go. And wherever he said to stay. He would stay. Do you remember making that vow yourself? Uh, Dear Heavenly Father. Please forgive me of my sins. And I will make you the Lord of my life. We, we made a similar vow. And if God tells us to go to our neighbor or to be on mission or share the gospel, no matter the consequences, and the cost may be great, we're not going to eliminate the cost may be great. But the mission is greater. And I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. Isn't there a song entitled something like that? Salvation is here. Who holds salvation? Jesus Christ. Jesus alone. 
This is really important culturally, historically, and theologically. So tune in with me just for a second. Because when the disciples were questioning when Jesus would return, do you remember what he said? You will receive the sign of Jonah. What is the sign of Jonah? I believe that this is the sign of Jonah. Jonah came to a point in his life where he realized one very thing very clearly. Only Jesus saves. Nothing else counts. If Jesus is the only one that saves, he's going to go to Nineveh. He's going to go to Turkey. He's going to go wherever God tells him to go because only Jesus saves. And when we as a people figure out that only Jesus saves, then maybe we'll become a part of God's plan. Then maybe we're on his page instead of God coming and being on our page. You know who Chuck Colson is? Great, great, great guy. Chuck Colson died, I think, about 10 years ago now. Or a period of time ago. And please forgive me. Chuck Colson uh, was sent to prison because he had an involvement in the Watergate scandal uh, for, for President Nixon. And whether he deserved it or not, I, I, I personally debate about that. But, but Colson once said this after he had gotten out of prison and started a new ministry in prison fellowship. God did far more in my life out of my brokenness than I could have using my own power, influence, and ability. But let me say that again. Let's, let's tune in. For all of us Jonas who think we can run from God and then we get caught in the belly of a fish, praise God. Because God can do far more in my life out of my brokenness than I could using my own power, influence, and ability. If a fish brings me to a place where God can do more with me, praise His holy name. Ah, if you're now, excuse me, if you're like me, I don't want to be in a fish. Do you want to be in a fish? So here's my prayer for us today. My prayer is that in some way we get to escape the consequences of a fish because we surrender totally to big idea number one. You remember what big idea number one was? God has a plan. And God has a plan for your life. And that plan will most likely involve grace and mercy. But I, my prayer right alongside that today is that if you're not connected to his plan, you're not connected to his plan, that God can, God should, send some great big fish to come swallow me up that I might get back on his page. Because he is my God. Because I love him with all of my heart. And I want to be on his plan. Amen. That's my prayer. That's my prayer for us today. Let's get back onto the plan that God has. And so what does the fish do. At the end of. Uh, the second chapter. And God. The same God that provided it. To swallow him. Caused it to. To spit him up onto dry land. Because the discipline. The lesson had been had. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, for all of us, we are fearful of fish. I am uh, fearful of the metaphor of this fish. Excuse me. So, Father, we just, just today ask for your grace and mercy that you would be gentle and effective. But, Father, if we're not connected to your plan, not connected to your mission, today, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would set us straight. For those of us Today that hear the calling of the Lord. Would you commit that? What I have vowed. I will make good. And make that your prayer. Right now. Please stand with me. And let's continue in this time of decision. You make your prayer to the Lord. Maybe you need to come forward. And, and, and have some of us pray with you. Or, or you just need to make a decision that says. I commit my life to be a part of his plan. You just respond because there's no fish too deep for him to hear our cry. Now, I'm not saying that today that you have to know that God's calling you to Nineveh. But that you would surrender your heart totally unto him. For wherever he calls, we want to be a part of his plan and a part of his mission. Now we're going to gather back together several times this week. I want to encourage you to be a part of ministry 
and missions as we go about them. But we have been closing service in a new old way. And my new old way, I mean, I really want us to get back to holding hands again one day. But we're not quite there. Remember, we used to walk out and I would say, brothers and sisters, you would say, we are sent. So we're going to add a few more words to that. A benediction that we say together. And after we get finished saying a benediction, we're going to sing a benediction today. So I will do or, or the leader will do as the church. And then we all follow in with we will love as Jesus. Are you ready to try it with me? You think you got it? OK, so I will go as the church. We, we will, will love as, as Jesus, Jesus has, has loved us. us. Serve wherever, wherever we, we go and, and share his good news with the world around, around us. us.